Hello, my name is Jenny Stewart. I'm the Vice President of Consulting at Construct Software, and I want to share with you five keys to successful large-scale Scrum. The first key I want to share with you is as much as possible, you want to establish individual co-located teams. I worked with one organization that actually had individual team members fractured around the world. So any single team would have people in the US, maybe two sites in the US, a site in Europe, a site in India, perhaps a site in Brazil. So the individual team structures looked a lot like this. So that organization now has to deal with communication issues, both inter-team and intra-team, which makes the scaling issue much more complex. One of the things that they started to change was to actually take each individual Scrum team and locate it as much as possible in a single geography. So there would be a team in San Jose, there would be another team in Boston, There'd be another team in London, another team in Bangalore, another team in Brazil, which makes the structure a lot more rational. Now we more have to focus on coordination between the teams, not coordination between the teams and within the teams. Did this happen to the organization overnight? Absolutely not. But was it able to reduce the complexity and bring together the teams more effectively and efficiently as they were able to do this? Absolutely. So the first key is whenever you can and as much as you can, each individual team should have the development team, the product owner, and the scrum master in a single location. That'll make the rest of this a lot simpler. The next key is to create a product level definition of done. I don't know how many individual scrum teams I've gone into who doesn't have a definition of done or has a very weak and not very shared definition of done. I worked with one organization, its definition of done was code checked in, compiled, and hopefully unit tested. Is that organization building near releasable quality software each and every sprint? I don't think so, right? And if that's an issue at the one team level, what's that look like for your product if your product has five teams, or 10 teams, or 20 teams, or 50 teams? The sum of the whole is only as weak as the weak part of the chain. So we need to make sure there's a shared product level definition of done. What does it mean for us to bring each piece of the product done by each of these teams to a state of completeness so that it's not just the team having a definition of done and the team building software, but the overall product is something that's actually available, potentially releasable each and every sprint. So for example, is the code integrated into the pain line? Is there automated regression tests that's being run? Are you doing unit testing at the project level? Are you doing unit testing as regression across the entire product? What kind of integration testing is being done? What kind of documentation is being done? How many defects are you going to allow to be found within the team level? Have a minimum, this is sometimes called a gold standard quality bar, but have a minimum agreed upon quality bar. You'll hear a lot of people talking about emergent design when they talk about Agile, that the architecture will simply emerge over time. You'll hear people talk about things like Yanni, ya ain't gonna need it, or BDUF, big design up front. Agile definitely is a proponent of don't build more architecture than you need and that the architecture will emerge over time. For the single scrum team level, that relied a lot on high quality people, senior people being inside of the team and really stewarding that architecture over time. That works great for a single team. What if you're trying to bring 150 or 500 people or 1,000 people to build a product? Can you have an architecture simply emerge across that many teams? I challenge you that that way lies disaster. I worked with one team, they had one product team, they had eight teams, and they really just did the emergent architecture and emergent design. They saw where it went. Well, after about nine months on that product, they spent six months with an architecture team re-architecting some of the basics. So while you don't need to do BDUF, you do need to make sure that you're minding the architecture. 
And you can do that in a couple ways. In small teams, it's not uncommon to have a person who's the lead architect, is the person everybody turns to. They become basically a subject matter expert across all of the scrum teams to help guide that, work with the teams to ensure that there's consistency, that common components are being built in the right areas, being modified appropriately by all of the different teams. Another approach I've seen people take is to create what I call a virtual architecture team. It's a virtual team with representatives across all of the scrum teams who meet on a regular basis to talk about architecture considerations, to do things like identify where in the product backlog do we have a, an epic or a story coming up that looks like we need to have an architectural discussion about it or a design discussion that crosses multiple teams who will lead spikes being done by teams to prove out architecture, who will talk amongst themselves about what teams need to actually build functionality into the core components or common components of the team. So a regular ongoing basis. It doesn't matter so much which approach you choose, but do recognize that emergent architecture in a 500 person product development team is a recipe for disaster. You need to steward the architecture. You don't necessarily need to do it all up front, but you do need ongoing oversight that happens throughout the lifetime of the product. So be that a person or a group of people who is actively evolved, or a virtual team that's formed from all of the different scrum teams, it needs to be taken care of. The next key is to converge frequently. I worked with one organization, they had six scrum teams and they were happily developing away on scrum, but they would go for six to eight months before they would converge the work of the scrum teams together. That's right, each and every team actually built in their own branch. So are they converging a product on a regular basis? Absolutely not. They were building little puzzle pieces. Hopefully that all came together to form a nice picture, but in this particular case, every seven months or so, they would spend two to three months doing integration. Again, with Scrum at scale, you wanna be building a near releasable product. So while you may not have a releasable product, you should be integrating the work of all of those Scrum teams preferably as often as possible, even at the story level, continuous integration as soon as the story is complete into the main line. Uh, at a minimum, the work of all of the teams needs to be coming together inside of the sprint after you've completed the work. Now that's not as desirable as having convergence within the sprint, but it is the place a lot of teams start because they don't have the integration in place and they don't have the automation in place to converge frequently. And by that, I mean every few days, if not every single day. Now, I'm okay with you starting there, but not staying there. I really do want a ongoing product that inside of each and every sprint, I know we're building a product that's potentially shippable, not just the little puzzle pieces that may or may not produce something for me that's actually uh, available for marketplace consumption. So now that we have a product that we're bringing together each and every sprint, the next thing to do is to create product level feedback loops. Scrum has built in feedback loops. It has two of them. It has the product feedback loop, the sprint review, and it has the process feedback loop, the sprint retrospective. Well, if we're just looking again at the individual teams, how do we know that we're actually building a near releasable quality product we need to bring in place opportunities to look across the work of all of the teams and do product reviews. These are sometimes called demos or product reviews. And again, these should happen hopefully the day after the sprint concludes, but at least before the next sprint begins, we want an opportunity to say, what are we building? Is it really what we expect? Are we really developing a product? Let's gather feedback from our stakeholders, maybe even from our end users, so that we learn within the course of the next sprint if there's anything we need to change now, rather than waiting until we're six sprints in, or heaven forbid, waiting until we actually release the product to recognize that it's not working together. Do these sprint reviews and product demos look exactly the same 
No, generally they actually look quite a bit different. So in a sprint review, it is the team, the development team, demonstrating to the product owner what the team has done within that sprint and having the product owner accept it. For the product demos, it tends to look more like a selected product owner or maybe the chief product owner is actually showing the major functionality or capabilities that have been built across all of the teams to the stakeholders, senior management, and users. So it's not every single story done on every single team. It really highlights the major capabilities that external parties are gonna be interested in and ways for them to really know we're making progress on the product overall. Similarly, we can do product retrospectives. So bring representatives of all of the scrum teams together and talk about what worked, what didn't work, and how we can improve as a product development team for the next sprint. Again, this isn't something that every team does every single sprint like it looks like here. I have seen organizations where it starts out with something that's done every other sprint or once a quarter. Uh, and I have seen organizations where initially it's a lot more frequent and then tails off to being a little less uh, regular. So for example, they initially start doing a product retrospective every single sprint and after things kind of stabilize, they go to every other sprint. But it should be on a regular cadence and you shouldn't go for more than two to three sprints without doing some sort of product level feedback loop. And again, this does look different because we are bringing together representatives from the team and we're not looking at what individual teams can do to improve. We're looking at what we as a product development team can do to improve. So generally, this looks at things like how well is dependency management being handled? How is the cross-team coordination and communication being handled? Are there integration issues that aren't being resolved that we're discovering late in the sprints? So they focus on how do we improve as a product development team. Scrum certainly scales. Constructs as an organization and we as a software development industry have learned a lot about how to help Scrum scale, but it doesn't scale all by itself. Scrum by the book isn't enough. You do need to think about some of the larger considerations and the most important consideration for you to think about is are you building a near releasable product each and every sprint? Or are you just building little pieces of things being done by teams and you don't know where the state of the actual overall product is. For really effective teams, you are always producing a near-releasable product each and every sprint.